Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Mga bagets po ang nasa likod ng event na ito. For youth, kayong mga kabataan mula sa iba't ibang sulok ng Pilipinas and with the ones youth. Ituturo sa atin mga roles na responsibilidad ninyo ng mga kabataan para sa pagpatibay, pagpaunlad at pagbabago ng ating food system. If our food system was resilient enough, uh, siguro during this time, uh, many of us wouldn't have to rely on the community pantry or getting food from um, ayudas. Society or culture tells us what we can appropriately eat and what we cannot eat. Every tree, every plant, every fruit you encounter, please you know, be grateful for it. It's not just the place that attracts tourists, but it's it's actually the food. Kaya ka pumupunta doon. It can remind them of home, um, and that's the, the, the that's what a, that's what a food product can do. That nostalgia. Of course, we want to encourage our children na magpartake sila sa gardening activities, and then turn may encourage natin sila kumain ng gulay. Grow your own. It's not just economical for you, but it can also mean fresher and healthier foods, stronger local economies, and lower carbon footprint. Filipinos are very good cooks, right? And Filipinos are very, very passionate about their food. We have to realize is that we Filipinos have been promoting our food since day one. Masayang manood, pero mas masayang sumali. It's a tong platform at avenue for you to also show kung ano yung galing at talino at innovative and creative ideas niya sa pagluluto. I really hate pausing shortly to peel shrimp while eating. Actually, we can we can eat the squash, the the seeds. With meal planning, it can help reduce food wastage by uh, cooking your own food, uh, discovering uh, indigenous uh, ingredients and um, supporting local. Matututunan natin ang iba't ibang pagkain dito sa atin sa Pilipinas in a fun and interactive way. Hey, game na ako, yan. Game na ako, yan. GG! Na Martha Mary. Pumupitan. May nakatama. Wow, may nakatama pa. Saan ba ito nakakain? Madalas itong gawing pulutan. Commitment. Commitment. Yan ang pangunahing ambag ng kabataan sa agrikultura ay commitment. Give us your wackiest, your funniest fiesta smiles. So now, are you all excited to start your hydroponics garden? You can grow the same plants in the same area and more yield. Sa ngalan ng aming pamilya sa sirka, lalong-lalo na sa mga sirka kabataan na nagsalikod ng programang ito, maraming maraming salamat po at mabuhay kayong lahat. May the fire of that one fire keep our passion for agriculture burning. Why I like agriculture or why I am here in agriculture? First of all, I like agriculture because it's food. I love food and it's there. Agriculture, you will understand what you're eating. Ano ang role ng mga youth sa agri-food system? Yeah, kasi food system, may apat na big process yan. May production side, then you have the processing side, then may transport side din doon, logistics naman, para naman i-transport sa kanya, hanggang sa consumer side at saka disposal. So, buong, buong complex na chain na yun, yun ang food system. The youth nowadays are really going out of their houses. It's because they want to find meaning. They want to see that they're contributing to the growth of our, you know, economy and our development of our country or in the world. Tayo as an important member of the community being in the education sector. That's something that na we We are in a powerful capacity to influence. Integrating agriculture in the curriculum. Maganda din na ma 
emphasizing difference ng sa rural at sa urban. How to get students interested in, in agri is to make them passionate about food. Kasi everyone eats and everyone has a favorite food. Sinishare ko din yung life story para para ma-inspire talaga sa kasi yun talaga yung kailangan ng mga youth ngayon, inspiration. In terms of this question, I would say, ano, sibuyas. Konting tawa lang, may luha na. <laughs> Uh, feeling ko man eh, looking at the right partnerships could really help you um, have that seamless mobility of your product. So support group for young entrepreneurs. It's really mentorship, but very important. So very quickly, I'll give you a visual journey of today's virtual youth camp. First, we had our campfire pep talks. Food is our umbilical cord to Mother Earth. Changing the narrative to make farming sexy. For the Bahay Kubo sessions, uh, there's a disconnect from the curriculum and realities. There's a knowledge gap on agri. And as for initiatives and solutions, um, having using social media as a communications channel for young people. And as for ways forward, to strengthen partnerships and collaboration with uh, an abundance of opportunities. With today's camp discussions, we want to gather youth perspectives on challenges and solutions in the agri-food system amidst and post-pandemic. Mabuhay! Isang magandang araw po sa ating lahat. I am Aaron Armonica from the Philippines. Sama si Dacha, Sanya Yap, Dari, Malaysia. Good to see you all. My name is Michael Lok. I'm from Cambodia. Hello, teman-teman. Apa kabar? I'm Bestiana Agustin from Indonesia. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. I am Muhammad Izuan dan Muhammad Daud from Malaysia. Assalamualaikum. Saya Felix Tifafong. Solidarity across generation is all about how we work together, trust and synergize with each other to make innovation for us. Agricultural sustainable. Solidarity across generation is important uh, because it's a key in harmonizing uh, between the experienced generation and the younger generation. The different generation may have different thinking ways in order to provide different ways to uh, to solve the problems and challenges faced in agriculture nowadays. Solidarity across generations. It's important and can be considered as a key to accelerate agricultural and rural development by uniting the awareness, knowledge, and perspective of different generations in attaining sustainable development solutions. The thing is that we should try to understand and connect each other and then uh, together with them. If you create new ideas and new investigations, that's can be first to accelerate agriculture and rural development. It can combine experience, knowledge, and technology together. So let's have empathy and go better together. We use a more energized and we can focus on the more than agricultural research and we have a lot of creations. The youth is the continuation, the sustainability of the uh, development either in your respective countries, region, and worldwide. Happy International Good morning, everyone, or perhaps good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining around the world. Welcome, welcome. This is the Southeast Asian Youth Fest 
brought to you by the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, or CIRCA. Particularly, the Young Forces for Agricultural Innovation, or Y4 Agri, through the cohort of the CIRCA Youth Ambassadors Platform, or SIA. I know, I know, that it's a lot of acronyms, so that's CIRCA by Y4 Agri through SIA. Allow me to give you a bit of a background of who we are. CIRCA is one of the 26 regional centers of excellence of the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, or CIMIO. We are mandated to strengthen institutional capacities in agricultural and rural development in Southeast Asia through graduate scholarship, research and development, and knowledge management. We serve the 11 CIMIO member countries, namely Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Timor-Leste, and Vietnam. CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government in the campus of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So we are coming to you live from Los Baños, Laguna, the special science and nature city of the Philippines. Among the priority areas of CIRCA in its 2020 to 2025 strategic plan is gender and youth engagement in agricultural and rural development, or ARD. The Young Forces for Agricultural Innovation, or Y4 Agri, as I mentioned earlier, is the center's banner initiative relevant to this strategic priority. Guided by the principle of by the youth, for the youth, and with the once youth, our Y4 Agri program aims to advance youth integration in ARD by providing platforms that give voice to the youth and nurture them as partners and leaders for agricultural innovation. As is our activity in this very, very nice Saturday morning. My name is Jean Labios, member of SIAP, and I will be your host and one of the moderators this morning. I now would like to invite our Deputy Director for Administration, Professor Joselito G. Florendo, for the welcome remarks before we proceed with today's activities. Mabuhay. On behalf of CIRCA Director, Dr. Glenn D. Gregorio, I am happy to welcome you all to the first Southeast Asian Youth Fest. This event is one platform that we are eager to host for the young ones and once young as one of the priority areas of CIRCA is gender and youth engagement in agricultural and rural development. The theme of this Youth Fest is about a food secure future and we want youth to share with us your voice. This learning event is a fitting way to be aware about the state of food security in Southeast Asia, to appreciate the best practices that you can apply to your context, and most importantly, to hear directly from youth on perspectives and ideas for pragmatic solutions to food system gaps. Making this event more meaningful are the young people behind this event, the young staff of CIRCA from different departments and units who comprise the CIRCA Youth Ambassadors Platform, or SIAP. From concept to implementation, CIRCA's youth are leaders and mobilizers making this event happen that is truly by the youth and for the youth. We are honored today to be joined by a lineup of food system experts who are youth professionals and even those who were once youth professionals to truly make our discussions intergenerational. I am also glad that setting the tone of the Youth Fest are two esteemed guests giving the keynote speeches. First is the country representative of Singapore to CIRCA's governing board and an associate professor from the National University of Singapore, Dr. Chu Fuk Tim and the International Professor of Sustainable Agriculture and Global Food Systems from Cornell University, New York, Professor Dr. Kin Marcho. Later in the parallel sessions, we enjoin you to speak your mind and to share your voices on special food system topics with our guest speakers. Hear the essence of their work, learn from their success stories and reflect on what youth can do for a food secure future. Again, welcome to the Southeast Asian Youth Fest. We are glad that you are here with us and we hope that this becomes an enlightening 
and enriching learning experience for all of you. My name is Joe Florendo. I am from Circa. Magandang umaga. Good morning. At maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Didi Joe. So are we all ready to exercise our youth voices today? Let's hear it through the chat boxes and react buttons. Type in ready or show your likes and heart react. Are we seeing it? Are we seeing it? Yes, we are. Okay, so the World Food Day 2022 calls on to build a sustainable world where everyone everywhere has access to nutritious food. I know we can all feel it. We have a multitude of challenges today. An ongoing pandemic that restricts movement, not only for people, but also of resources. International conflict and tension that affects food supply. Rising food prices that curbs access to healthy and nutritious food. And a rapidly changing climate that affects food production. Our team saw it in all your 1,207 months during the registration. All of us are asking, is there enough healthy, nutritious food for everyone given our expanding population and everything else that is going on. Luckily and fortunately, and as mentioned by Didi Joe, we have scored highly esteemed resource persons to join us this morning to help us understand, become aware, and appreciate food and nutrition security. We are pleased that our two keynote speakers will help us understand the state of food security in the Southeast Asian region and beyond. Afterwards, we will have four parallel sessions with experts who will share their thoughts on the topics of multi-stakeholder partnership and sustainable investment in food systems, rediscovering Southeast Asian food culture and understanding the changing food landscape and its effect on food security, securing a nutrition conscious young generation by promoting healthy diets in schools and innovation opportunities to counter food and agriculture sector disruptions. Later, when we are about to proceed to these parallel sessions, we will be sharing the Zoom links in your respective chat boxes for your access. I know you're all excited to listen to our speakers, but allow me to just go over some instructions on how you can send us your questions and comments about today's presentations so we can hear your voices. For those of you who are tuned in via Circus Facebook page, you may type your questions in the comments section, kindly indicate your location, and or country of origin. If you're tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A box, which you would find in the menu bar on your screen. Kindly indicate your location and or country of origin as well. Our team will collate, curate, and compile those questions for me, and I will con convey them to our speakers. So hopefully we'll be able to cover as many questions as we can in the time remaining. So please be clear when you're posing a question to a specific presenter, or if it is a general question that anybody can respond to. We will do our best to get as many questions as we can as possible during the open forum. And also kindly refrain from posting your email address in the comments section. You can provide this information to us upon responding to our evaluation form and e-certificate request, and the link will be posted at the end of the forum. All right, we are ready for our keynote speakers. First, to help us set the tone in understanding the state of the food security in the region and the dynamics of the food supply chain, we have Dr. Chu Fok Tim, country representative of Singapore to Circus Governing Board. Dr. Chu is currently the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Science at the National University of Singapore, or NUS, overseeing the science undergraduate curriculum and international study abroad programs. He also oversees the undergraduate curriculum of the Combined College of Humanities and Sciences at the university. He is an associate professor of the Department of Biological Sciences, teaching both undergraduate and postgraduate post molecular genetics and crop biotechnology, and is the principal investigator of the Functional Genomics Laboratories. His key areas of research are in the genetics of allergic and skin diseases, as well as large-scale crop and animal breeding. He is the lead scientific consultant to several major agribusinesses, including, including Syngenta Crop Protection, Syme Darby, First Resources, Genting Plantations, and Olam International, where he works on the genetics of major crops and the commercialization of the molecular breeding and seed production systems. My fellow youth, let us all welcome Dr. Chu Fok Tim. 
Thank you very much. Can you all hear me very well? Yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. And I already can feel the energy in the room. Wow, look at all the hearts and thumbs up. Wonderful. Now, let me share my screen and then I go straight into my presentation, right? Let me do that right now, and I hope everyone get to see the presentation. Okay. Show me a lots of thumbs up if you do see the presentation online now, and let me get started. Wonderful. I'm flooded with thumbs up right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, a very good morning to the youth of ASEAN. And uh, I am here from Singapore. I'm from the National University of Singapore. And it is really my pleasure to be speaking to you this morning. I'm gonna just have a little brief overview of our understanding of food security and in particular in Southeast Asia. But I come from a very small little city state called Singapore. We have our own restrictions and we have our own difficulties. We are almost 100% urban. And in the current form, we import more than 90% of our food. And therefore, we really depend a lot on the world's supply to be able to feed ourselves. However, within our little country, we would also want to try to secure our food ensure our food security for the longer term. And I guess within our little uh, restrictions, we will try and, and do as much as we can. And there may be certain lessons that we may be able to learn. And at the same time, uh, we may be able to also contribute to the food security of our region overall as partners, basically. So let me just go forward by starting and setting the tone of what really food security is about. And that uh, when we talk about food security, what exactly are we trying to uh, aim for? We all know, as uh, defined by the World Food Summit back in 1996, food security really is when all people, yeah, and I emphasize the word all, all people at all times have physical and economical access to what? To sufficient, I underline the word sufficient, safe and nutritious food, basically that will meet their daily needs and food preferences for an active life. Now, any disruption to this will really mean some degree of food insecurity. So if we really look at all these key parameters, there will be many things that will determine what is called food security. The availability of food. Are we growing them? Are we producing them? The imports. Can the processes, the transportation, and so forth, all combine um, to make up what we call the availability of food? The second one, of course, is not just that the food is available, but they must also be accessible, right? You may have food, but if it's not accessible, it's stuck somewhere else, then that also contributes to insecurity. Accessibility also includes the economic side of the story. Is there appropriate pricing for food? Is there proper income in the populace to be able to access this food? And finally, of course, it will also include the, uh, the way we utilize our food. Is the food nutritious? Is it safe? And also, does it come in a form that is uh, hygienic? and sanitized. All these will contribute to our food security, the stability of our food. And also another term that I will want to emphasize is the robustness of our food. Now, we all know many things are happening in the world right now, right? We've got climate change. Um, we've got severe weather. We've got political crisis. We've got war, conflict. Sometimes even those conflicts may be all across, halfway across the other side of the world, it will still influence us. 
that's how connected we are. We all went through or are still going through what we call the COVID-19 pandemic. All these individually and in combination will influence availability, access, both physical access, economical access, and also how the food is presented to us. The global and longer term uh, disruptors or disruptions will be something that I will be most uh, worried about, right? The prime of this all is really climate change. And I think um, I'm very glad that we are all aware and also we have experts here who will talk a lot about this and therefore I don't need to continually emphasize this, but it is something that we must be having right in front of us. A very good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Tan Siang He, he is from Crop Life Asia, uh, that's housed in Singapore. And he very recently, the 13th of October, published this uh, article in Business Times in Singapore. It's about the rising food insecurity, in particular, the rising food insecurity in ASEAN and in Asia. He really emphasized the fact that, you know, there is climate change. There is a lot of uh, conflicts happening all over the world. And then there's also that pandemic and many more. But one key factor that is really unique to us is that, number one, this rising food insecurity is really pinpointing and focusing it on Asia and ASEAN because all these disruptors will somehow influence Asia and ASEAN very dramatically. Number two, however, let's not talk just about the problems that we have faced. We all are probably aware of them, but let's talk about how we can come together to make this insecurity not necessarily just go away, but actually we move away or alleviate away from uh, the insecurity. And he really emphasized this. One, in Asia or in ASEAN, many of our food production systems are really coming from small holders. And the definition of these small holders are really those that are fewer than two hectares of land. And these breakups of little, little small holders really make up the largest proportion of our producers in Asia. What we really need to be able to do is that we need to create partnerships, partnerships across the food value chain to make our regional food system, as is written in the article, to make it more resilient. And this is really crucial. And in the face of our growing challenges that we've just mentioned and the consequences of this, it is absolutely paramount that we have partnerships across countries, partnerships between government and private agencies, NGOs, partnerships with the small farm holders in particular, especially since they produce the majority of our food. So key word here is partnership, how we can actually create this partnership. And today we are talking about partnership here in this forum here as well. So we are really uh, understanding that, that one of the key ways for us to overcome insecurity is to join hands and work together to solve these problems and focus them onto the people that needs them most, which are the really the small farmers and the smallholders, landholders. The next, the next component that he's actually talked about is about technology. And technology must play, is playing and can play an increasing critical role to transform our food production and security. However, the challenge is not just having the technology, but really bringing the technology to where it really matters, which is the small farm holders. So really, the time of, uh, for us, all of us to do this, A, to have that partnership, 
and to bring that technology yeah amongst all of us in the private sector the government the civil societies the entire chain across the region it is time now for us to come together to ensure these most vulnerable people have the tools have the resources that they need to do what they need to do which is to grow more safe affordable and nutritious food this is the key message actually that he's written in this article and he really hit the he really hit the nail right on the uh, uh, target really what we really need to do so really my message should be focused on how we really gather the partnership and uh, use the technology but in the places where we really need it most and i want to show you examples of such partnerships that actually can be made and are already happening across the world and in particular in Southeast Asia. You've heard that I consult for some of the major companies such as Olam. Olam is a Singapore-based company, but it is actually operating all over the world in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and so forth. Olam has got this process called Olam, uh, um, uh, Digital Olam Connect. This is really to allow the smallholders have the farmer's advantage. What does it do? It benefits more than 70,000 farmers across more than 12 countries, both in Southeast Asia, as well as in, um, in Africa. What it does is it gives information to the smallholders. Now, handphone is very, very uh, um, uh, available today even in the uh, uh, rural areas in many places. And because handphones are so pervasive, they've decided that they will use that. And then I'm not even talking about the very smartphone type of handphones, yeah? Um, they even talk about the simple uh, messaging type and even all that. Some of these will allow transactions to be geotagged, timestamp, allow for traceability of transactions, this whole system allows um, also customers to have transparency of the price that they can get, what the market price is, allows them to bring things to the market as soon as possible when they know the price is right. They also know when the supply and demand is, and then uh, they don't need to go through a third party or intermediaries. They also then allow the intermediaries to be the collection centers for communities, thereby create uh, opportunities in the rural environment for this to happen. They give insights into the weather, the pest alerts. They provide some degree of education in, in whatever devices that is available, also allow for cheap finances and so forth. What this means is that if you think about what we have in our hands and ask, this simple handphone, can we use this for something? Can we provide information that is free and accessible for people who may not know the supply and demand, who may not know the right prices, so that uh, at the end of the day, they will be able to be plugged into the global supply chain at the end of the day. So this is just a simple example of how technology can actually help access give educational inputs, uh, give them real-time understanding and so forth. So the youth of today, we should try to see how we can utilize what we already at hand and think what can we transform this into a useful tool that will help the smallholders, the folks that do not have access to. So this is one example of utilizing technology and utilizing technology that can actually give rise to advantage to the people that really need it. Another example, and I really love this because I just visited Circa for the board meeting recently, and I had the privilege and pleasure of visiting the Institute for uh, Plant Breeding right in the campus at UPLB. And I'm so impressed that uh, at the end of the day, this institute has been around for the longest time to help the 
uh, the growers in the Philippines, in the rural growers in particular, with new development, new improved varieties, and uh, undertake the breeding and crop improvement, collect all the uh, unique uh, foods and food seeds that we have uh, in the country and in the region, and assist people, assist people to provide them with quality seeds so that they can have higher yields, higher, better productivity, better nutrition. And I was so impressed that I was so engrossed by all the little uh, farms that we, the, all the little development that we have. And what I was told, this goes into the system directly reaching out to the small farmers themselves as well. This is a, a true example of how technology can work, but both in both cases, you can see there are partnerships, partnerships between private sectors, partnership between the Institute of Higher Learning, and also partnerships between individuals of different groups, the government involved here as well, and so forth. I want to just move slightly to a term that I, I really think we should really focus on when we talk about food security. We talked about food security being in the, in the earlier part where I said it's really about access, availability, and uh, the utilization of the food that we have. But the term I want to emphasize here is the robustness. Food security robustness, uh, can one, one can define it as the country's ability to withstand disruption to its food security system. And how do we do that? We actually have a balanced capacity to A, make food available, B, to ensure that this production is sustainable, and then also to provide the necessary infrastructure. So it's not just about production, but allowing those that is produced to be sent from the right places to where it is needed. Infrastructure, policies to support both the domestic production policies that will support trade, to allow trade to happen, and also policies and infrastructure that will allow and manage food demand and affordability. All these are the key elements of food security. But really the emphasis now I want to put is, how do we do this even in light of disruption? And we are very, uh, uh, we are clear about this right now recently because we all went through COVID-19, we are going through disruptions in our food systems because of conflict. And we all understand there are further longer term conflicts. There is such an index called the Rice Bowl Index that precisely try to look into this robustness. And when we evaluate the robustness of many of our ASEAN countries, we will find if you look at this, these are just in comparison to many other countries in the region. And um, the dotted lines here actually gives us a threshold where we think if things are not just business as usual, will we be vulnerable? And if we actually drop below the threshold, there is a danger that we may be vulnerable. And it's disheartening to see that many of our own ASEAN countries are actually having a food security issue where we are not exactly robust should things be not uh, business as usual, right? Some of the major food secure countries like these are above the threshold, but it starts to drop down below the threshold and many of them are uh, within the region here. So this is concerning. What are these components that makes up the robustness? Again, the key, both enabler and disenabler, disablers uh, of food security come into the picture. Do we have uh, an, a good control or a good hold of the environmental uh, resources that we have? Do we know and are we able to manage the demand and supply and also the price? Do we have sufficient policies, both for the production and the trade, and also very more importantly, actually, at the farm level, do we really have access to technology and innovation? Are there sufficient ed uh, education and so forth? Now, the majority of these 
robustness really lies in the farm level, right? Farm level is a major, con uh, farm level enablers or disablers are really the major contributors to whether one is robust or not and whether we can stand uh, any disruption to our food secure system. Now, let me just, in the last part, very briefly ask a few questions and just reflect on myself and on my own country where we, I, I stay in. We are a very small country and I'll ask the question, how food secure are we in Singapore? What lessons can we learn? What is Singapore doing to assure its own food security then? Uh, because we surely have a lot of challenges. And what are we going to do moving forward? What are the prospects and what are the possibilities? These are the questions I'll ask. There may be lessons we can learn from here. There may be things that may be different in the different countries and the different contexts, but uh, definitely we can share. And it may need for us to customize our solutions for where we come from. This is Singapore and we do have some parts of Singapore that produce food. And I love going to this place. Um, this is right in a place called Tengah in Singapore. And Tengah is actually a Malay word for the middle. So really this is the middle right in the center of Singapore where we have these little farms, greenhouse farms and so forth. And this is one that is a uh, weekend farmer's market that I always go to. In fact, I was uh, almost there in the morning <laughs> uh, every weekend as well. And you have actually people growing these and growing them. But really in Singapore, we actually import 90% of our food. So really, where are our food coming from? We actually have 90% of our food imported. The other parts of our food comes from food that we produce overseas in contract farms. We produce some ourselves in-house and we have some reserves and stockpile. So the question that I ask then therefore is how secure is Singapore? Now, if you look at all the uh, uh, charts and indexes, people somehow put Singapore as very secure in the foods. And how is that so? We don't produce many of our foods. How is that so that we can be secure? But really, when we look at the robustness of our food system, we also need to realize that we may be uh, uh, disrupted if there are things happening all over the world. So for us, the policies that we put in place are that we need to make sure our food system is resilient. And since we import so many things, we really need to diversify our imports and not just depend on one source and one place. Secondly, we need to expand our self-production so that this self-production becomes a, a buffer should things happen in our imports. Thirdly, we need to expand further right, both for informal and informal agreements to produce. Of course, we also need to make sure we use our nutritional and our existing food well, not waste them, reduce the waste and so forth. This is where we are. We are really a unique place where 90% of our food comes from all over the world. And we have um, uh, only local production that produces about 30% of our eggs, 8% of our fishes and fish proteins, and about 4% of our leafy vegetable at the moment in Singapore only. And we're not just feeding the 5 million residents, we are feeding about 5 million residents plus maybe uh, four times more every, any time uh, of the year uh, due to the transit people, the transient people, that such as tourists and others as well. So you can see this is where we get our food from. And what we really need to realize is that for us to be more resilient, we need to uh, probably diversify and strengthen our uh, food imports from all over the world. In the 2014, we import from 160 countries. We've expanded this to even more now, to even close to 180 to 990 countries all over the world. But this is still not good enough. We want to be able to uh, 
uh, have supplies that are not focused from just one or two sources. And this is a key policy for what we are trying to do, that we need to diversify from all these sources to be able to have multiple supplies just in case anything happens and any disruptions happen. The second item that we realize in Singapore is that food security and food self-reliance is very much uh, connected to international trade for us. There is a, uh, uh, some level of domestic production that is needed but that some level of domestic production is really to generate enough capacity in say, for us to one, import more, and two, buffer us should there be anything that happens. So for us, the understanding is that international trade is essential for our food security. And therefore, if you look at it, Singapore has purposefully decided that they will be in the global trade they will be involved in agriculture, despite the fact that we only have less than 1% of our land being used for agriculture. We must be plugged into this thing. We must be involved. We must be involved in the production. We must be understanding the trade. We must totally be in the entire supply chain of the whole global trade. And that's why we, you see that Singapore is really the agri-hub for many, many commodities. Uh, it's the world pricing hub for many commodities too. It's the home for about 70% of the top agri commodities trading companies. And really at any one time, 20% share of the global agri commodities is actually coming in and out of Singapore at any one time. To us, this is the concept of what we call dynamic stockpile, that we are plugged into the world and that we are involved in it. This is an example which says that actually at any one time, we are really uh, trading over 1.3 trillion of the agri commodities. But that's not good enough as well. As mentioned, for us to be robust, we also need to have internal production. How do we have internal production that is able to produce for our needs, but at the same time buffer should there be any disruption? You can see this is only the little places that we have, and we have aqua zones around Singapore that are able to produce aquaculture fish, but we produce not enough for ourselves. So what is our plan therefore? Well, to secure further production, we have a plan called 30 by 30. 30 by 30 simply means by 2030, we should move our production ability to move up to 30% of our nutritional needs. And this is actually an opportunity for us to turn our challenges into opportunities. What is Singapore? Singapore is all urban. So we therefore have no choice but to focus on urban agriculture or urban food, food production technologies. We also need to make sure that our consumers demand, uh, our consumers have safe, healthy food, and therefore we focus a lot on safety, on food that is healthy and food that is sustainable. We are a hub for uh, uh, R&D, and ex because of that, we think that we should take this and exploit this R&D into the agri system, not only for ourselves, but really for the region and beyond. One example for this is that this is what we do with vegetable farms. We only have 1% of our land used for agriculture. How can we produce more? Well, the way we used to think about it is that we need land for soil production. We are now going indoor onto high rises, onto uh, uh, public places that are actually originally all urban. And hopefully we are able to produce not just 140 tons per hectare per year, but even up to 2,500 uh, 2, tons per hectare per year. How do we facilitate this? This is probably best facilitated with key technologies. Even the sea-based farming, 
or what we call land-based farming of fishes. How do we move from what we used to do at 40 tons to even up to 240 to 250 tons? And from land-based even to grow them from 34 tons to 500 tons. And now we are also focused on how do we deal with alternative new types of proteins. There are already technologies and technologies today are actually coming to the point where they're becoming mature for us to use. And these are some of the examples, very recent examples, right? So the next thing we want to be able to do is harness our people, excite our people that this is important and use our technologies to this advantage. Focus people to apply them to tropical agriculture and aquaculture and in particular urban agriculture. How to raise land productivity, how to reduce costs, how to improve nutrition, but how to also make all this sustainable. This is just some of the key, uh, uh, key goals that we have set out in our, what we call the Singapore food R&D story. This is one example, and this is my own research assistant who's able to now grow indoor. This is a kale, and many of you may think this kale is grown uh, maybe uh, outdoor for say, four or five months, but really this was only a four-week-old kale, actually. And you can see how this is, how big this is compared to even my, my small little research assistant. But this is really possible by using technology, combining all our resources and thoughts and understanding of how we harness this technology to be able to do this. This is exploiting the understanding of our genetics and selecting based on the genetics. Another example is how we can grow fish like this in multiple aqua decks. And this is one that is constructing and it, by today it's already operational. The whole seven story has multiple aqua decks like that. And we couple this with uh, genetics that is able to breed them uh, using deep genetics so that they can grow faster and produce uh, healthier, use less feed. And this is also a chlorfish with all the eggs here. And this is able to actually grow and, uh, uh, in this kind of system. So really, how can we then not just meet our own needs in our little tiny island, but now expand this to say, can we grow together? Can we exploit our resources and technologies and know how together as ASEAN and come together in partnership and in uh, allowing our technology to reach to the places where really it is really needed. So let me stop here and I'll be very glad to answer many questions later on. And should anyone want to contact me, this is my email and this is my contact. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I will look forward to hearing many questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Chu, for that presentation on food security, particularly explained to us stability robustness. In the 1,200 reg registration responses, the economic access was brought up multiple times, and we can see how this is such a pressing concern, especially for the forecasted global crisis in 2022. And from your presentation on the dimensions of food security, then definitely food access and prices will be a challenge. Lastly, I'd like to particularly note from your presentation what we can do for smallholders because they are really those that need help the most. We here at CIRCA also believe this is very, very important for us in the region and even beyond. So to our audience, do not worry. Our speakers' presentations will be uploaded to our website so you'll be able to access these as reference materials as well. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Singapore's story is quite inspiring. Definitely, those are some lessons we can learn from and customize to our local context. So to keep our discussions even more exciting, I was just told by our team that we are giving away this beautiful <laughs> Southeast Asian Youth Fest or SYF bag. But for you to get a chance to win this uh, bag, we need youth to be active in this forum. So actually, we can see you very, very active. 
I think we have around 600 online in Zoom. Thank you. And um, either you ask questions here or later, you post on Facebook about your learnings from this forum. Just make sure to follow our Facebook pages, Sirka and the hashtag y for agri And in your posts, use the hashtag SYF2022 and hashtag y for agri so we can monitor your posts. So far, so for those who asked questions today and posted on Facebook about their learnings, we will raffle the names and pick five who will receive this bag. We will ship this wherever you are in Southeast Asia or beyond. Are we sending them if they go to the moon or something? I'm kidding. So for those of you who already have questions for Dr. Chu, key it in the chat box so our team can collate already. For those joining via Facebook, just post your questions in the comments section. We will try to raise these later during the open forum. On to our next keynote speaker. From Dr. Chu, where he presented the state of food security, we now move towards the relation of this food systems to dietary, nutritional, and environmental outcomes. This is another topic that arose from your registration, so thank you. Um, we have with us this morning, joining all the way from New York, who is 12 hours behind Philippine time, is Professor Dr. Kin Marcho, International Professor of Sustainable Agriculture and Global Food Systems from Cornell University. Dr. Cho has over 25 years of experience in working on sustainable agriculture, extension, extension modernization, food systems, nutrition, and rural development with government agencies and universities, private sector, NGOs, and nonprofits globally. In 2010, she established the Dr. Kin Marcho Foundation, supporting over 1,500 children from village schools in Myanmar by providing scholarships and building libraries. In 2016, she was a U.S. Fulbright Scholar teaching extension modernization for agriculture and fisheries in the Philippines as visiting professor at the Central Luzon State University. Professor Dr. Kin Marcha, good evening. The screen is yours. Thank you. So, hey, good morning, Southeast Asia. Good morning to everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Cho, we can hear you and you're receiving a lot of hearts and Ooh, like buttons and like emojis. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I love it. So that's the Southeast Asia. So good morning, everyone. And before I share my screen, so I'm using um, a little green because you see, uh, we have a very cold weather here and uh, starting on the fall and uh, very cold. And also again, this is evening and uh, so 12 hours behind, but I'm so much looking forward to hear from our youth, your voices, Southeast Asian voices, your perspectives on food system issues and food insecurity issues. So that's, I'm very happy to be here with you guys today. And I will try my time and to share with my expertise. I'm really proud of all of our Southeast Asian youth. So let me share my screen with you guys. Okay, here we are. So you have the first speaker. So you guys hear how the food security and also food availability, affordability and access utilization in our region, in Southeast Asian region. Now you can hear more about all the global challenges, what we are facing today. That's not only in our Southeast Asian region as a globally. So the way what we eat, the way what we grow food, crops, livestock, and fishery, and no longer with this so many global challenges, how do we deal with that? And you guys, the youth, you have a lot of energies and powers and very innovative. You guys are cha change makers. How can you involve in this the time of the transforming our food systems 
to every individual to get healthy and nutritious food for every household members. So youth, why do we call youth? Who are the youth? I will share with you our ASEAN youth and the global youth, and also what are the actions for present and future? And how can our youth, you guys be champions for our food systems transformation? Youth leadership matters. You guys are the leaders. Congratulations, before I start, to circle for this, whatever the abbreviation SA1AP, and Yan Forces for Agricultural Innovation, and also for Sioka Youth Ambassadors Platform, by the youth, for the youth, and with the one's youth. I love it. So good. So great principles. And congratulations to Sioka's for this festival. So let me start with the youth. When you look at in this graph, how is the global demographic of the youth? The age 10 to 24 years, that's we call it youth. So the number of the youth between the age 15 and 24 is about 1.2 billion, which is 80% of the global population. And the together the youth and children 10 to 24, 1.8 billion. That accounts for 40% of the global population. You can see the age of all those youth in the 1.5% annual population growth between 1950, that was before I was born, and 2010, 2010. So this is United Nations Global uh, 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 Population Division. So with this 1.8 billion young people in the world, 90% live in developing countries. Only China alone, 225 million, and 235 million youth in India. Hey, look at our Southeast Asia. The population, we have over 681 million population in Southeast Asia, ASEAN, one third. One third of our ASEAN populations are youth. You guys, it's projected to peak at over 220 million by 2038. So what are the youth actions for present and future? So the United Nations, the Food System Summit that we hosted last year in September, are the youth actions for present and future. So all the young people played a central role in global deliberations and actions toward equitable and just food systems in preparation for the UN Food Summit. In the pre-summit, the global youth, the propose commitments and actions to what a better future for our food systems. What did they did that? They have been involved in healthier and more sustainable food everywhere, schools and universities, et cetera. And also healthy eating, active living practices. Stay away from the ultra processed food, sugary beverages, and reduce consumptions of animal based and focus on plant-based food and do regular exercise, physical activities, and also involved in healthy food productions in the community gardens and school gardens and the backyard gardens, and also plastic usage reductions and plenty trees. So the U has been really involved in a lot of activities today. In the future, youth can take actions in supporting local governments, local farmers, family families, in producing healthy, safe, and nutritious foods. Youth can talk about healthy food production and consumption on social medias, advertising healthy and sustainable food, and also actual food labeling and food marketing. And youth has been involved in food waste management by doing, making a grocery list before shopping, and they just buy the food what they need, they just cook what they need. No food has been wasted. So the climate crisis and environmental degradation across the planet, you can see clearly the growth and 
Migration of the world's human population, along with the need for food, shelter, water, and livelihoods, have been a major driving force that have been changed the equilibrium of the planet. These changes include deforestation, ocean acidification, pollution, loss of biodiversity, desertification, and so on. So some of these processes have triggered climate change and climate-related natural disasters, poor air quality, water, and food shortages, and depletion of aquatic food sources, and conflicts over resource. Many of these challenges are driven by the need to feed an ever-growing and increasingly urban population that demands different and more diverse diets. We are in the middle of the catastrophe breakdown. When you look at that in the odd system trend, everything's are increasing carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, all the way down to deforestation land and aquaculture and everything. And when you look at the socioeconomic trend, again, population, GDP, energy use, water use, transportation, all the way down to communications, all of them are increasing. So the climate change impact really negative net adverse impact on our crop production yield, the yield decrease. So not only to affecting the quality, the quantity of crop production, yield decrease, and also rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations may also diminish the quality of the food. You can see that. Sardine crops like rice and wheat, a staple crop. They are nutrient content, proteins, iron, and zinc. Very important nutrient content has been decreased because of the carbon dioxide defertilization effects. Not only that, imagine the poor socioeconomic, the population with poor socioeconomic status who mainly rely on this stable food like rice and wheat. Their nutritional value, their nutritional status is very poor and they are facing with malnutrition. They don't have enough nutrition. Although they are eating a lot of wheat, a lot of rice, they have a malnutrition. How can we help them? And again, the climate change affects not only the quantity of the crops production, yield decrease, and the quality of nutrition of those proteins, irons, and zinc, and also the proliferation of pathogens and pests. In tropical regions, look, the maize and peanut productions with the aphatoxins is so seriously. The people who eating corn and maize and the corn, the uh, maize and, and peanut has been might be associated with those kinds of problems. Like especially for the increased risk of morbidity and mortality, poor pregnancy outcomes and child growth. Think about that, how climate change impact on our food. Now I wanted to show you how food systems really impact with the climate change. So you can see the food systems are very complex and interconnected. So many, you can see there are so many drivers and a different context impact on the food systems. And the, or the outcomes is the diet, the, quant the quality of food, and also for the nutrition, for the human and for the environment. So complex these food systems, we need a good assistant approach. As a nutrition scientist, not only to provide advice, what should you eat, what fruits and vegetables, what vitamins and minerals and protein, not only that, they can collaborate with the other expertise in crop production, processing and marketing, labeling and packaging or the value added product. So the most important is working together as a multi-sectoral approach to reach our goals, to get our individual household members access to healthy food and nutritious food everywhere and every time. So harmful system is 
are so important and very complex interconnected with multiple drivers, the outcomes and stakeholders, we cannot get a better understanding of interventions and policies that reduce all forms of malnutrition and mitigate environmental consequences without a system approach. So that's why we really need to transform our food systems that benefit both human nutrition and health. Why we are protecting our ecological resources and supporting livelihoods and affordable foods and upholding social, cultural, and ethical values. Look, how food systems really um, contribute to greenhouse gas emission. You can see that 34% food emission from the, uh, the food and 66% uh, from non-food. The 32% food emission come from land use and 39% of food emissions come from our agricultural production, where we use energy for our farm machinery, we have uh, fertilizations, and we have emission from fertilizer application, we have emission from manure management, we have emission from pasture management, and also we have energy for fertilizer production, and so on. Another 80% food emission from supply chain, which includes our food processing, transportation, packaging, and retail. And the remaining 11% of food emission come from post-retail, that our consumer, when we are preparing food, then we lost a lot of like uh, also food emission and also after consumer that waste uh, food wasting. So the total, you can see how food system uh, contribute to greenhouse gas emission to 21 to 37% or to their greenhouse gas emission come from the food system. And agriculture use 70% of fresh water resource, a lot. And 60 millions of marine fish store has been really out of store, maximally fish. And 1 million animal and plant species are now tripped. How environment stress on food production. So we have always increasing almost 7.5 billion global population. We need a lot of food, both in urban and rural area. Look at in this graph. The red color is represent all the meat production and the blue color represents stable crops, rice and wheat and those bollies. These two color, you can see all the greenhouse gas emission most from animal product, animal production. So are you the meat eater? You love to eat beef, steak, pork chop, lamb chop, or whatever. Think about that. How much you are contributing to our climate greenhouse gas emissions. And again, in the blue color, you can see the staple crop productions using a lot of fresh water, nitrogen application, and phosphate application, of course, land use. That's in the, you can see, so the other, of course, vegetable, fruits and nuts, fruits and vegetable, and other crops, and also other uh, um, or emissions contribute to uh, the environment. There are multiple burdens of malnutrition and food insecurity. You can see over 800 million people of the world populations undernourished, and 2.2 billion address are overweight and obese. Come on. Some people are eating a lot more than the body need. Some people, they don't have enough food and good hunger. That's what facing today. 3.1 billion people cannot afford healthy diet. What does mean a healthy diet? You don't need to be worthy to be healthy. You don't necessarily need to eat beef steak or pork chop or goat or meat. You don't necessarily need to eat organic. You need to eat what your body needs, a small portion of different things, the dietary diversity, all the nutrient dense foods, not necessarily need to be healthy, fancy food, but should be saved and locally grow and fresh. I will show you later how nutrition we are losing when at the preparation time, the way what we cook, 
not systematically, we losing all the nutrients while we are preparing the meals. So you can see in the, in the, in the, in the map, the dark red color of the countries, these, those countries are really in severe or those are, 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 are affected. When you look at the under five years old children, according to World Bank high income group for groups, 149 million children under fives are standing, 49 million wasting, and 39 million overweight. You can see in the blue color, that is low and middle income country has a lot standing and wasting. And at the meantime, you can see the orange color at 39 million children overweight, mostly in upper middle income and high, less, not that much, mostly in upper middle income and also lower middle income, 31% catching up upper middle. This is not good because overweight for the children. Look at that, the prevalence or anemia among the reproductive age of women, 15 to 49 years old. This is the latest statistical research, WHO and Global Nutrition Report 2021. During the COVID-19 impacts on nutrition, you can see 9.3 million children wasted and 2.6 million children standard and 168,000 children's death and 2.1 million women suffering from anemia is very much. So access to nutritious food is very foundational for life, a good health and prosperity for all of us. Healthy diets are dense in micronutrients. Where do we get the micronutrients? Mostly fruits and vegetables. We can get from animal-based product too, the micronutrient. Two billion people worldwide are affected by micronutrient deficiencies. One or two or three minimum. If you are a micronutrient deficient throughout the life cycle, you can see all those things, very serious. And you can see here is the latest research that East Lancet showing the top 10 risk factor for death, the cause of death, the top 10 risk factors. Number one is dietary risk. We didn't eat properly. That's why almost more than 11 million people are dying because of not eat properly. High blood pressure and go down to other things. In the right side, you can see that. The number of that are globally associated with, because look, the dietary risk, the, the way what they eat, the diet high in sodium, low in whole grains, People eat ultra processed food because easy to get it, easy to prepare. Low in fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts, and omega-3 fatty acid, low in fiber, diet low in polyunsaturated fat, low in legumes and pulses, but very high in trans fat and very high in sodium processed meat. So look at in ASEAN, 10 ASEAN countries. We have a 681 million populations in ASEAN countries, go down from the, the smallest one in Brunei, less than half a million population. Indonesia has a 275, more than 275 million population. You can see in the maternal mortality ratio, a country like in Myanmar, my home country, look at that, very high, 250. And then another country is Laos, Indonesia, and also Cambodia. And under five mortality rate, again, Myanmar has a good number, 45, and the Timor, 44, and Laos, 46. And also the probably the probability of dying from any um, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, and also the um, um, uh, between 30 and 70 uh, age limit. You can see again, those countries are higher numbers. And also the prevalence of under five year children standing wasting and on uh, underweight and overweight um, again. So this is our ASEAN, what's the latest information, our diet related, how uh, poor impact on the health. And now let's talk about the blue food. We are looking for the healthy food, sustainable food, or our low income families, everyone. The poor man, Food, people call it small, tiny fish. Nobody like it. 
but this is very high in nutrition. So the blue food means food come from ocean, rivers, and lakes. These are essential for our food systems. The nutrient rich a small tiny fish, especially for a people, a population who are vulnerable and uh, like young children, pregnant women, and lactating mothers. So those people really need a very good resource for these uh, uh, nutrient rich and small tiny fish. Good things a month ago in, in, in the Philippines, Philippines has a sardine supply, not a problem. A country can produce annual productions more than double than the country's demand. It's so good. Very high nutrition sardine fish is really good for the people. So now we are talking about the nutrition sensitive food systems. So that is not go beyond the step of uh, uh, grain productivity and places emphasize on the consumption of micro, uh, micronutrient rich non stables through a variety of market or non-market interventions. So that approach really not only consider the policies related to a macro level availability and accessibility to nutritious food, also focus on household level and individual level determinants of improved nutrition. So in addition to agriculture, the intra-household equity, behavior change, food safety, and access to clean water and sanitation, all of these are integral components of the food systems. Look at that. This is the conceptual framework of the food systems and the environment. You can see in the environmental inputs such as soil, water, and also including the weather patterns. Those influence our food systems through their impact on the production, processing, storage, transportation. This affects localized all those food environment where the consumer's intervention with the food system, the consumer buying the food and eat the food through the food um, availability, the quality, safety, and food affordability. The proximate outcomes are really the minimizations of chemical or the contaminants from pests and insecticides and growth promoting chemicals, all the minimum exposure of food safety, the quality diet, and also food loss and waste. So each of these proximate outcomes are really affect to the both human health and environmental health. We need a sustainable production and consumption. That's why both sides, not only for the producer farmer, also consumers, everybody, including farmers, we all consume food. So who are the key stakeholders to make our food system sustainable? The food producers and small and medium enterprises and consumers, all of us, and the public and private institutions, which can create an environment conducive to suitable, sustainable production and consumption. The game changer for food system is the water. No water, no food. So that's why if we are wasting and losing food, food loss and food weight, that means we are losing and wasting water. So the reducing food waste and food loss, it is the very important entry point to mitigate our water scarcity and to optimize water use. One kilogram rice requires 3,000 to 5,000 liters of water. Imagine you are the rice eaters, one day minimum three times. Some people eat four times of rice every day. Think about that. So reducing food waste and food loss, what are the costs of these food waste and food loss that are numerous and throughout our food systems? during the production, processing, distribution, retail and food service, and also consumption, we're losing food. Overall, one third of world food production has been thrown away. 931 million tons of food waste across the three sectors, household levels, food service, and retail, according to UNEP 2021. 121 kilograms of food per capita wasted. That's really huge negative impact on the environment. Almost 10% of greenhouse gas emission 
and also 25% a quarter of the world's freshwater resource wasting. That's why the Sustainable Development Goals Target 12.3 calls for reducing half, 15%, per capita food waste from 121 kilogram to let's say 60 kilogram at the retail and consumer levels, and also reducing food waste at the production and throughout the supply chain, including post-harvest losses by 2030. How do we integrate our nutrition information into agricultural extension education programs? And what about the youth participation in this critical moment? We have in more than a decade, research education about how to integrate these nutrition and agriculture programs. We have been a lot of evidence and a success stories about multi-sectoral approaches. We work with different sectors, different ministerial, agriculture, health education, communication, and transportation using one health approach. These multiple pathways really influence, agriculture influence nutrition through these multiple pathways. You can see in this graph, the food production pathways, agricultural income pathway, and women's empowerment pathways. That is how do we integrate nutrition message in agricultural programs. Let me share with you very briefly, here in the United States, land grant university corporate extension systems, how do they educate engaging the people for these uh, 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 nutrition sensitive food systems? The five major programs, sustainable agriculture and food systems, focusing on all of those, including urban agriculture, hydroponic, community and economic vitality, and environment and natural resource, and nutrition and food safety, also obesity prevention, and 4-H, the youth development and strengthening families. All these five major programs reaching in the communities and providing education throughout the food systems, starting from the supply chain. So providing a program digitally connected, electronically, a platform or the database or all the food industry, farmers, producers, processors, agritourism, and the consumers, restaurants, and food, all of the information in one place electronically, and people can communicate. So, and also this a multi-sector approach, 21 land-grant university, land-grant institution, working together with the government, Department of Agriculture, non-government organization, private sectors, and also other different organizations in each state. You can see in that we are interconnected as a national level, but in each state, all the different organizations as a collaborative approach using and these sustainable nutrition sensitive food systems. And also application, mobile application, every consumer can get access to what fruits and vegetables are available in season and which farmers are selling, what product in which farmer's market. They can easily increase healthy food access in the community, especially throughout the COVID-19. It's very useful. People get communicate direct to the farmer, make a delivery, all the healthy food access direct to the door. And also this program is very useful for researchers and policymakers using internet mapping tools as well. And bringing that program to the communities and our youth from the family community, the, parents, the children from the farmers, they are undergraduate students. They bring all the fresh fruits and vegetables from the farm to the communities. And our undergraduate students, we set up a table and provide cooking demonstration and nutrition education for the peoples in the communities using all the fresh ingredients from the farmers and providing and modifying recipe for Asian culture, African, Latin American, Mediterranean. What about the cultural food? We modify the recipes. And another one is making collaborative approach in the community faith-based. So bring the farmers, again, small farmers, small farmers. Yeah. The, all the fruits and vegetable farmers are small farmers. Bring the farmers to the community, making connection using the electronically digital platform, making the connection and make a delivery in the community, healthy food access increasing and more visibility in the community. So the church leaders. So we're working with over 6,600 churches across New York City in five boroughs. 
Monday through Sunday, seven days a week. We have been communicating with all those community leaders and bring our farmers from upstate all the fresh produce and making accessibility for healthy food in the communities. The youth participate in these food systems and making connection with the farmers and bring the produce and selling their parents and their teachers. The children learn about hydroponic, agriculture, entrepreneurship, and using ICD to conduct farmers and food economy and food and nutrition. Look at that. This is a high school student, uh, grade 11, 12, and 13 corner. They produce their own food. They know how to make money out of it. Raise tilapia in the basement, 3,000 tilapias. That water go to the third floor, grow vegetables hydroponically in New York City. Everything done by the youth, the youth. They learn STEM education, all the science and technology, and they learn all the food system, nutrition, sustainable agriculture, environment, and everything. Almost 200 farmers market across New York City. Our youth and our graduate students and most of the graduate student interns set up a table at each farmers market, provide food and nutrition education. Using the farmers produce and making recipes, cooking demonstration, provide education hands on very effective. And another one, collaboration with the Department of Health and provide a van. So this is very a special truck, come with a bed in sink, wash the vegetable and cooler and storage area. A very successful community outreach program. And throughout the summer, June, July, and through October, November, each van reached every day, 50 to 100 customers and provided the whole uh, uh, over 10,000 pounds of fresh produce very small, successful community program. And again, reaching out all the Department of Education, all the school district providers, reaching them, provide the education, our farmers, fresh fruits and produce, make a direct connection, bringing them, make deliver. Every school has the accessibility to healthy food come from their own state locally grown from farmers. Again, another faith-based community, more than 6,000 in churches. So they provide food pantry and soup kitchen for 3.8 million people registered under hunger. They get a free food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, even grocery package. So they got all the free food at the faith-based community. We provided all the food and nutrition education and nutrition sensitive food systems, bring all the farmers and produce, provide all the healthy food. And again, for the woman who, doesn't need to speak English, doesn't need education, but they can buy using this technology, buying the farmers wholesale and sell in their community retail and learn food and nutrition education. Bring this message to the internationally. Young pineapple farmers, a group of 500 young, they all of them are mostly young farmers come to meet me and we provide education using electronically how to link to the markets and how to make a value added pineapple products. And again, in Rwanda, that's a very young people involved in this extension and dairy farmers and tea farmers provide nutrition education and food systems about the environment, the healthy nutritious access and everything. The similar in Ethiopia, farm to restaurant, all the farmers, the, the farmers, the children, the youth, they provide all the fruits and vegetables from their four acres from organic produce direct to the hotel's five-star Hilton. So making this, we provide education, let them use as a champion ambassador for their community and also get them involved. Here in the Philippines, that's right before the pandemics. So I give a nutrition sensitive workshop with a lot of like a, uh, youth extension workers in the Southern Mindanao. So they are very involved using our locally grown fresh fruits and vegetables, I teach them how to make healthy recipes and with Filipino context. And I like a hands-on, get the foods and nutrition and food system educations, everything, so anything, get them involved. Again, nutrition sensitive animal husbandry practices at the Carabo Center in Central Luzon. So again, look at that. Predominantly all the young people, how they are champion and women. So I provided how we really encourage and empower our youth and women in the leadership team and for the sustainable future for our food security in the country, in the region, as a global. And here in my home country in Myanmar since 2015, I teach nutrition information to agricultural students. 
I'm a graduate student at the university. And for the faculty, I provided train your trainers or the nutrition information to integrate in the agriculture. So the youth, they learn about the food. They have no idea about nutrition, what they are eating. Now they got the idea, the way what the crop production and also nutrition information and also all together inclusive how food system should be sustainable future. And of course, the particular in upland areas, how they need in terms of nutrition sensitive agriculture and aquaculture to feed the people who are in need. Let the students, the youth involved in engaging farmers, let them have intervention about food and nutrition through the cooking demonstration, using all the ingredients from farmers community garden and uh, let them involve teaching them hands on. The most important is always trying to educate them, eat local, seasonal, fresh, affordable, accessible, safety, nutritious, and healthy food. The recipe with the principle of diversity. So the government official, again, most of them are just graduated from the university and college. They are now extension workers to provide advisory service to the farmers and community members. They need nutrition information together with agriculture information. As a countrywide or the regional directors extensions, they get all the certificate training from me and making a food calendar, food availability, food accessibility, food affordability exercise through the food calendar by different agro agroecological zones. Again, always through the food supply chain, we always integrate nutrition information in the whole supply chain and value chain and even under waste management, how to make all those sustainable. Trying to reach a multi-best uh, 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 partnership, go to the faith-based community and also trying to collaborate with them, provide nutrition education at the church. That's what we do here in New York City. I brought that message to to the to 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 Myanmar in Chinste. So that's a very well accepted nutrition message and relevant too at the faith-based community. Provide everybody need to be healthy to come to the faith-based to do the faith things. Again, another multi-sector approach, working with the Department of Health, provide food and nutrition training to healthcare workers, nurses, and training. They have been learning for health issue. Now they get integration about food crop production, which part of plant they are eating and what nutrients they are. Ministry of Hotel and Tourism. Again, all youth, 20 years old, 19, 18, 21, very active, full of energy to become a master chef, provide them food and nutrition education along with food safety and hygiene management. And also the most important is to source locally grown fruits and vegetables, fish and seafood, and also seeds and nuts and create modified recipe and to create five star meal, very expensive fancy meal at their hotel restaurant. So during the pandemic, again, another food service provider that means including uh, food uh, uh, restaurant hotel managers and ministry of hotel, hotels and tourism people, ministry of science and technology and FDAs, those people get food crop production information and also nutrition information together. That's really very useful for our now the secure future uh, uh, sustainable food systems. So what should we eat for our body and how much and how often? Very simple. Study from our brain. What do we need for our brain foods? What do we need our, for the muscles and for our body energy, protein-rich foods, plant-based, animal-based, seeds and nuts, and fiber rich food, and also micronutrient rich, mostly fruits and vegetables, vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and K, and minerals, most importantly, calcium, iron, folate, iodine, potassium, magnesium, and zinc. Not a big deal to think about healthier food. Just only think strategically a little, what is your income and resource available? Just think about that and also trying to learn systematically what you should eat and how much. So don't eat too much rice or don't eat too much fancy food and meat. Just always, always a diverse diet for anything a little. Always go to the rainbow. We always tell them all the rainbow color, the colors are very uh, efficient. So if you have a more color, you get more nutrient. 
So that's why always combination, you don't need to eat that much, just a little but diverse and locally grow. Don't go for fancy food imported from other countries. And again, always to prevent your nutrient loss. Most people eating very fun, even organic food, but when they prepare, they didn't do a correct preparation and they lose like overcooking and a lot of min nutrients that are in the bio, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, 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 water light. And also into uh, vitamin, uh, water soluble vitamin, vegetables washing a lot with the water, you lose all the vitamins in the washing waters. You throw all the water and also overcook vegetables. You are eating organic vegetables, you overcook, you don't get any nutrition. And also again, for the uh, meat, you overcook, didn't properly storage in the frozen or freezers or anything, everything. Please try to prevent not to lose your nutrients. So just practice, what do you eat? Just practice yourself, breakfast, Monday through Sunday, seven days a week. Change it on the vegetable diet. How you, what is available in your neighborhood, in your uh, accessibility, in your incomes, in your neighborhood. What is accessible, affordable, available, these three principles. Try to prepare easy within five minutes. You are changing vegetable diet for your lunch and dinner, or 100% vegetable, you can do it. And there's a recipes modifying, and in terms of cold food and hot food, and you can do all the salad, always trying to eat avocados or wonderful vegetables and carrots and potatoes and, and salad in with the apples and fruits and vegetables, always inclusive. And also all the stir fried vegetables, don't overcook, don't lose your nutrient, always trying to use fruits and vegetables, stay away from all the soy sauce, oyster sauce, and fish sauce, and a lot of sugars and MSGs and whatever the uh, uh, artificial powders and flavors and everything. Stay away from all of them. Just use simple fruits and vegetables. And chili, use peas and beans for vegetarian diet. You can need, you can get your protein from all peas and beans. It's easy and affordable, accessible. I can prepare within 15 minutes this meal. Only avocado, you can create for breakfast oatmeal with the avocado. And also you are Christ on avocado and the bread, avocado spread, avocado toast, avocado salad, avocado spaghetti, avocado. You can do even avocado, so many things, recipes in vegetarian. So by the way, I did modify with my students. So more than 300 recipes of Mediterranean diet, Asian diet, African diet, European diet, Latin American diets. So we have more than 300 recipes I did modify. Anyway, we need to take a business and usual approach to achieve the uh, Paris climate change targets. So you can see all those greenhouse gas emission. If you, we don't go the business as usual, look at billions and billions and billions of tons of greenhouse gas the food emission. So we never find our goal. We never reach our sustainable development goals. So the food emission from 2020 to 200, uh, 2100, if we achieve one of the following in scenario, let's say, 40% reduction when the high yield. So that means not to use chemical fertilizer to increase yield. We have to focus on biofortification. We have to focus on engineering, genetic crops, high improved varieties, and that is more important. And also the food waste go down to half and also heavy calories. Don't eat too much rice, too much wheat, and too much meat. Everything should be moderation. You can stay with the food while you enjoy it, but don't eat too much don't eat too often. And then improving family practices and plant-based diet, if we really follow one of these, we try to reach our this uh, greenhouse gas emission to reduce this portion, this portion. So we need to focus on the entire food system. You can see to maximize the increasing net nutrition along the food supply chain and the climate change. So look at the entry point and exit point. So you see on the top is the, 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 the things what we need to do it and the entry point to get nutrition maxima and also to max minimizing nutrition, we have to exit those things. Any plastic pollutions, keep doing that. This is very important. Uh, every single uh, uh, individual and households and community, look at your left and right, how many plastic things around you. So please think about that. And food safety, everybody, 
food business people, education, academia, consumers, and policymakers. We all have a role to play, whether we grow, we process, transport, we buy, or we sell, we food. We all, the food safety is in our hand. If we work together, we can all achieve our safe food and for our better health. And we, uh, on September 28th, three weeks ago, so I was at the conference in the White House in the United Nations. So look, we have uh, the first ever in my age, 53, this is uh, in, within 50 years, the first ever conference hosted by the White House, and the hunger, improving nutrition and physical activity, reducing diet related diseases. Because during the pandemic, nearly two thirds of COVID-19 hospitalization in the US were related to obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure. That's why a national strategy for next 10 year plan that put it 8 billion US dollar committed by more than 100 different organizations to reach these goals or the free uh, government schools get a free school meals and school can cook more from the scratch purchase direct from the farmers. So farmers get more marketing channel and, and this is contribute rural economy. So that's a fight um, our pillars, improving healthy food access and integrate nutrition and health. So as an initiated, food is medicine. So all the medical students now need to get more learning hours to learn about crop and food system along with nutrition and health. So you see the girl at nine, only 70 years old girl at the panel discussion and 21 years old boy from New York. So he just graduated. So they are at the panel and talking about how they are champion for the sustainable food system, increasing healthy food access in the community, and also representing all the low income neighborhood and how can be you a champion leadership for the uh, secure future uh, sustainable food systems. So that is the circle, the October 16th. So uh, last Monday, you celebrated all the multiple global challenges we all are facing. You can see name on it a lot. 193 million people experience high acute food insecurity. So two thirds of those people are from rural farmers. And 160 million children worldwide engage in child labor. And 3.1 billion cannot afford, afford healthy diet. 30,000 people are forced to flee their home because of conflict and persecution. And so on, so on, so many things. That's the multiple global challenges. It is time to work together and create a better, more sustainable future for all of us. Nowhere is this more than true in the food system. It must deliver nutrition. Why we are protecting biodiversity. We must utilize and protect natural resources and must ensure both human and planetary health. Nature can no longer suffer from how we, the way how we produce, how we consume and how we waste the food. If we really reduce down half to our per capita food waste and also improve farming technologies and practices and also the changing diet based on plant-based so that we can keep the food system within planetary boundaries. The most important is that dietary changes. So please go for plant-based. So engaging youth, how can we engage our youth in the food system to improve nutrition outcomes? We design it for youth inclusion. You should be in every, youth can be in study from the designing, implementation, evaluation, all the steps. They can be inclusive in agriculture and food systems. And the, the youth, the young people are very critical for the, the stability, economic growth and development today and the future. Youth are very innovative. They have their own solutions. So put the young people in the center and also in agribusiness and agriculture productions, have them become a leader, a business leader and agri entrepreneurs. So as a global community, we each have a role to play in bringing forward those left behind. And uh, by making our agri-food system more inclusive, sustainable and nutrition sensitive from governments to private companies, 
civil society, academia, and all individuals, including youth. We all need to be a part of that change. We need to build a sustainable world where everyone, everywhere, has regular access to enough nutritious, healthy food. No one should be left behind. In this webinar and Youth South Seago, Southeast Asian Youth Fest, I see young people with a lot of more than 500, 600 registered, more than 1,000 registered. So you have a lot of potential, aspirations, intelligence, and passion. You could do your part as a young individual. Don't need to go out to find a new planet for us to escape to. Just do a little things for to help your community. Remember, small things make a big difference. Contribute your perspective from Southeast Asia on food security issues and food system transformation. Make your voices heard for a food secure future. You are change makers, you are innovators and influence of the region. Nelson Mandela once coded, youths of today are the leaders of tomorrow. I will say, youths of today, you all are the leaders of today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Dr. Cho, my key takeaway is food systems are indeed complex. So one of the things I caught earlier is that youth are change makers, and that is very important. Thank you, Dr. Cho, for saying that. So is everyone here challenged? Can I see some reacts? <laughs> All right. So because like what Dr. Dr. Cho said, 90% of the youth are in developing countries. Imagine if we can earn that 90% towards campaigning for food security across the entire agri-value chain. Imagine how much influence we'll be able to do, right? So thank you, Dr. Cho, for your challenge. So the main highlight that we took from your presentation is that climate crisis has affected the nutritional quality of our food intake. And with a growing population, then climate change does have impact on the food system. But here's the thing, food system in turn has contributed to environmental stresses too. So thank you, Dr. Cho, for sharing with us how we can perhaps alter our approaches. We'll have to alter our diets from food production all the way to consumption. Some other key important uh, keywords that I will drop here uh, because we, I, I figure that these are things that we must all take note of and put in our radars. Nutrition sensitive food systems, resolving water scarcity, food loss and wastage, and lastly, a good strategy to engage the youth in food systems to improve nutrition outcomes. This is by integration of nutrition in education programs which can eventually scale out to communities. So we have a project on this here in Circa, and an in-depth discussion on this later will be under parallel session C with Dr. Jess Fernandez of Simio Recfon. With that, let us now move on to the open forum. This will be a little quick in the interest of time. We can see that Dr. Chu has started responding to the questions in the chat box. Thank you, sir. But our first question to give Dr. Chu some time to drink her water, <laughs> Dr. Chu, we are eight years away from 2030, and the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World 2022 report states that hundreds of millions may still face hunger by then. That's, that is eight years away from now. During the registration period of this event, an interesting question that floated is that, do we still have opportunities? Do we still have a chance given our current complex state and the direction of where we seem to be going? So what can you share with the youth on this matter? Thank you so much for the question. And this is an urgent question. You, you've just put the fire under my seat right now by saying we've got eight years and counting, actually. Eight years and counting is not a lot of time. So the youth today must get out of their seats right now and take, like Dr. Cho said, you're the leaders of today already, not wait till tomorrow. We must act today. Now, 
what do we mean by act today? We cannot wait till, oh, let's let the technology incubate and let's let the technology takes its effect. Yes, we do that. But we must act on the things we can do today, which is, like Dr. Cho said, change the way we treat our food, change the diets, stop wastage. Those things each of us collectively can do and make that small dent. Little by little, we will grow that mountain to solve this problem. Don't say we cannot do this because the, the, the problem is insurmountable. Don't say, oh, this is too much time. Let's all just go back and then wait for it to happen. No, I would say do the little things we can do. Do the little things for ourselves first. What can we do for ourselves? We can stop wasting. We can, like Dr. Cho said, I heard that very clearly. Go to the market when we need it with a list and buy what we need only. That we can do. Now, if we have so many youth in ASEAN and Asia, each one of us collectively do that. I will tell you, we will make a dent on that uh, percentage of how much we are not going to waste, how much of the food production we will be able to use. But waste is only one part of it, I would say. You would say, how can then we make it a, a, a clear effect? I, I, I saw a lot of good questions on uh, how we do things in Singapore and why Singapore wants to be able to focus on science and technology. Work in science and technology, we need to encourage more people to get involved in this get involved in this to be able to say, I will be a change maker that will create solutions, solutions for today and solutions for tomorrow based on my creativity and based on what I've learned collectively as both as an individual and collectively as well. So two things, do what you can do as an individual first, do what you can do in your community at home, around you, do what you can do for your family, then move on to the communities that are surrounding you in situ, in your place. Apply your minds to it. Apply technology that you have, applies your creativity that you have, creativity that you have. You know, growing up, I used to watch this uh, nice little show called MacGyver. I love this show called MacGyver because he's always tinkering on something, creating a solution out of whatever that he has in the surrounding. That's what we need. We need all these MacGyvers in our surrounding to be able to do this and find uh, solutions rather than just say, let's look at problems and say, these are all problems, I can't do anything. These are problems. And in Chinese, the, the word for adversity in Chinese character, if you turn it around, it becomes another word. The word for adversity, you turn around in Chinese actually means opportunity. Let's look not at adversity as problems that we are all just going to face and do nothing about. Turn it on its head and make it opportunities for us. That is what we can do. Now, of course I can say, let's go and do more specific things, but you know, we start with the small things first. Then collectively we can do things together as ASEAN, uh, both in the bigger things, you know, share knowledge, share uh, uh, resources that we will actually grow together. I like this analog where we say, if like the tides, together we lift the tides up. When we lift the tides up, all the ships on the sea will get lifted up together. That's what we should be doing in ASEAN. Lift ASEAN up together and all the countries will be lifted up together. Hopefully that's something we can do. All right, thank you, Dr. Chu, I like that. So everyone, be a MacGyver. So you don't have to, to take it too grandiose, right? This is what Dr. Chu is saying. You can just start with whatever is at your arm's length and to collectively, we will just make that then. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Chu, for that very good answer and for that very inspiring answer. So Dr. Cho, nutrition education is important for kids and even for adults, but it is difficult to change perceptions and influence behavior to transition into a more sustainable diet. 
I think this is a very good one. So what effective strategies do you think can we implement to be successful in behavioral change into a more sustainable consumption? The very good question. <laughs> because because everybody, everybody loves to eat what they used to eat. And also changing behavior, it is very difficult, but you can do it. You can do it, not overnight process, not overnight process. Today, I'm going to lose my weight. I'm eating only salad. And tomorrow eating my hamburgers and very energy drinks, everything. That won't happen. It won't happen within 24 hours process. So, and even I saw a, a question in the chat box. So the problem is during the pandemic, two years down the road, and people have been encouraged, eat whatever you have, eat, 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 to fight against the virus, to fight against COVID-19. One way is correct, but scientifically, so we have a lot of patients came after those who eat a lot during the pandemic, the GI and gastrointestine, a lot of problem. The body, everybody, we have on our body, the body cannot adapt, cannot absorb all of them, whatever you eat it, all of them. So this is the very clear and simple message. So whoever have a, a not affordable and not accessible, especially during the pandemic, everything, the food cannot flow, a lot of restrictions, restriction by regional, local, and in country, the food cannot flow here and there. So people looking for what available and near. So think about that. So whatever you have available, if you have only potato around you, okay, potato, but the message is don't add too much salt. Don't add sugar. Don't use a lot of oil, deep fried potato. Why not bake potato? Bake a potato or white potato or something like that. So always a simple, simple strategy for every single food, whatever accessible and affordable. Again, you don't need to be healthy to be wealthy. If you have only $1 for one day, I can make a meal for you, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with $1. I can make it. I can make it. So this is only you are the most important. If you have an intention, if you have a will, if you have a mindset to change your own behavior, you can do it. The people easy to argue. I'm now 85 years old. I'm now 70 years old. I've been eating all those things throughout my life. Never ever problem. It's okay. It's okay. But that people is only one in an a million, even not in 1,000, very rarely. So the people who realize this and they, they come in the emergency room, when we have in the emergency room, and the problem because of diet related diseases and finally arrive in the emergency room. Then they meet me and they can tell me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I should eat this, I shouldn't eat this, I shouldn't eat, this, I shouldn't. Now you are too late in the emergency room. You need a surgery. So that's why everybody send a message before you get emergency room, before you get any spending a lot of money for your surgery, we don't see our naked eye with what happened in our inside organs. But we have only one mouth. Anything, everything you put in your mouth, we don't have an extra reserve body, only one body. So you are the most important person to change your behavior or you don't want to change, it's okay. Just recommendation. If you don't want to change it, if you just want to eat it, just go for it. Don't worry until you get the emergency room. I see you and to be treated as a surgery because I have a lot of patients I'm re seen every day. So they really apologize me. They didn't listen to me. And finally they are now in for surgery. So anyway, so our Asian food, please respect to our Asian food. Very good. All our Asian region foods are so good. I'm working here as a global level. Our Asian has so many good food. And I'm always so proud of our Asian meal. I modify all the recipes, show the rest of the world. Here is our Asian foods and so proud. But the only thing is we always think about that. Stay away from the 
high sodium, uh, oyster sauce and fish sauce. And that's what we love and we enjoy in our Asian culture. All the fish sauce and all the now uh, the flavors, artificial powders, MSGs. Stay away from this and always incorporate fruits and vegetables, spices, onion, garlic, ginger, lemongrass, green chilies, and dills, and bizzards, and lemon, everything. All the spices, turmeric powder, black pepper, and chili powders. Those things are really nutritious and have a lot of uh, uh, medicine effect and also nutrition and benefit. So much things. So that's why stay with our Asian culture. Don't worry about that. Nothing wrong with it. Go for it. Eat our Asian food. Very good. Just only trying to reduce sugar, fat, and salt, not deep fry. Also stick with our Asian food, but increase fruits and vegetables, season nut and pulses, beans and pulses. That is because this is not fair. People who eating a lot of meat and now say, don't eat meat, meat based, plant based. This is not fair. In poor country, we don't have enough meat. Even we eat a small little kind of meat. No problem. Go for it. Eat meat if you like it. If you have accessible, if you are affordable, go for and eat it. But don't deep fry and don't put a lot of sugar and artificial condiments. So then as long as you are with this strategy, you are all, if you do that individually as a youth and you are the champion, change your diet yourself. Don't ask your uh, 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 whatever the uh, pay money for. The, you don't need to pay money for it. Just change your mind behavior. If you want to lose your weight, do intermittent fasting for like a, not 12 hour intermittent fasting, everybody can do that. If you do intermittent fasting, do minimum 18 hours or 20 hours intermittent. Don't eat anything for 18 hours for once a week or twice a week. Then you can see the results. Don't change overnight. So this is really amazing. So the youth, you have a lot of energy. You have a lot of creativity. I know that you guys are very passionate. You have a very good uh, game change and really like the change makers. And so I'm so proud of you. Remember 30 years ago, I was like one of you and I graduate student 20 years old. So now within 30 years, I become a stay senior teenager. I would call that. <laughs> anyway, so again, I really keep my heavy eating, active living, run every day, one hour, rain or shine. I run one hour every day. Even today, before there's not, I run it. So this is really keep me energetic and I can do all the work, what I wanted to do, what I want my teaching, research, everything and traveling and provide education around the world. You need to be healthy. You need to be healthy. It doesn't matter how how wonderful you are, beautiful, how wealthy, how educated, how many PhD you have. If you are not healthy, you cannot do anything. You cannot enjoy your life. You cannot do anything. Life is nothing if you are not healthy. So that's why to be healthy, you need to practice healthy eating, active living, eat always like it. fruits and vegetables a lot, peas and beans, fish and seafood, and stay away from uh, saturated fat, deep frying and bakery products, and also uh, stay away from sugar and beverages, and also stay away from um, um, the uh, sodium salt. So then you all will be healthy. And you can do for Southeast Asian, the champions for Southeast Asian, and come to the United Nations for global, meeting with the global youth and uh, share your perspective and your energy and your success stories with the world. And also, I'm pretty confident our youth from Southeast Asia, you can do it. Everything is possible. You have opportunity. You can do it if you do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Thank you for being such a cheerleader for the youth. So if I may just share, while you were doing your presentation, there's a huge team of young um, circans here. And you were all like, we have to modify our diets. We have to do this. We have to do that. But... I, if I may just say, it is true, uh, Southeast Asian food or Asian food, one of the best foods in the world, I just have to say. So thank you, Dr. Cho, for encouraging us to, you know, change our behavior. So collectively, we can also, you know, in our own ways, with our own bodies, we can do that um, influence or that um, contribution towards food security in such a, you would think that it's not, 
it's not contributing, but it is. So thank you, Dr. Schoffer, for highlighting that. So that sums up our open forum. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Dr. Chu and Dr. Cho, for our wonderful dialogue. There are still questions on Zoom and Facebook, but in the interest of time, we have to move on to our parallel sessions. But both speakers have already shared their email addresses. I'm sorry I have to say this. Feel free to reach out to both of them. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation. Thank you to our speakers for your inspiring talks. I've learned so much, so I am sure our participants have as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu Fook Kim and Professor Dr. Kim Marcho. On behalf of Circa, SIAP, and our audience, I express sincere gratitude for taking the time to join us this weekend. It has been a pleasure to have you with us. Dear participants, how are you? That is a lot of reacts I'm seeing in Zoom right now. <laughs> okay, we are now ready for our parallel sessions. Before I send you off, let me share again our topics and quickly introduce you to our speakers. More introductions will be done inside the parallel sessions, which will run for one hour, and then we will, head, we will all head back here at the plenary for sharing our session takeaways and our closing activities. The link to our evaluation form and e-certificate request will be posted at the end of the forum. For parallel session A, multi-stakeholder partnership and sustainable investment in food systems, we have Krisa Marie Borja, Regional Manager of Sustainable Investments from Grow Asia. For parallel session B, rediscovering Southeast Asian food culture and understanding the changing food landscape and its food and its effects on food security. We have Jesse Varkes Jr., Executive Director of Ugnayang Pangagham Tao Incorporated or UGAT Anthropological Association of the Philippines. For parallel session C, securing a nutrition conscious young generation by promoting healthy diets in school. We have Dr. Jesus Fernandez, Deputy Director for Program of Simeo Recfon or Simeo Regional Center for Food and Nutrition. And for parallel session D, Innovation Opportunities to Counter Food and Agriculture Sector Disruptions, we have Juka Laxina, President and CEO of Go Eden Philippines. The links to access these are flashed on your screens and may be found hi, in your chat boxes. Just click on the link of your preferred session. So go forth and we shall see you in the parallel sessions. Our experts are waiting for you and we look forward to hearing your voices. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. So how was your parallel sessions? All right, so how did your sessions go? How did you find your speakers? Feel free to type it in the chat box. How was the interaction with the participants? Okay, so there are four reporters. Um, so there are four reporters. So there are four reporters in the parallels uh, from four reporters from each of the parallel sessions because you are brave souls who are going to report in this plenary you have a merch can i have a sample of a merch please you have a merch we will mail it to you um we are inviting you to become a speaker a co-host of the plenary right now so please do accept our invitation in there you will find my email address please do email me uh, your credentials or maybe just say hi I can email back please do send we, we, we will ask for your credentials wherever you are we will send this to you this very nice packet or nice bag all right do we have all four um, presenters now how many are in we have Lance we have Roslyn we have Agus and we have Joel. Oh, we have all four already. Okay, so I think <laughs> Okay, I think most of you are back. We have a very very exciting next part. So as you have been instructed in your parallel sessions, we have a sharing activity. So and this is because we want your voices to be heard by all of us here to your wider audience. So the brave souls serving as reporters, as mentioned, will receive the SYF merch. So message us at the Circa Facebook Messenger 
um, if you want, or if you are already co-hosts of the session, you will see my email in the chat box. Please do email me your mailing address, name, address, and contact number so we know where to send your merch. So let us go from parallel session A to D. Please introduce yourself, your name, location, and the challenges and solutions that emerged in your discussions. Remember, you only have five minutes to do this, so it can be very, very quick. We know your parallel session topic already, so just say, just uh, share with us the solutions that, that emerged, uh, sorry, the challenges, common challenges that emerged and the common solutions that emerged. And from my session, let us start with Lance. This is parallel session A on sustainable investments. Lance? Um, hello. And yeah, first, um, I would like to thank this opportunity. Yes, and thank you for the South Southeast Asian Youth Fest for giving this such an informative um, learning sessions and yeah, for the CIRCA and other organizations. And yeah, first is my name is Lance and I'm from the Philippines. And we discuss a lot of, in on our forums, we discuss a lot of problems and solutions. But yeah, I'll just give um, a little bit more a little bit information because of the time limit. So first, uh, a little introduction that in our Philippines, yeah, it's um, an, an agricultural country that really need to, you know, invest in an inclusive growth to build, to build more sustainable agricultural food systems that are silent to calamities and food to climate change impact. So first, um, I'm going to we discuss um, the lack of investments, right, on infrastructures, um, on the livelihood of the small hold farmers, because you know there are a lot. Yeah, we might say I. Yeah, in Philippines, there's a lot of farmers. Yeah, because Philippines has a lot of, has a lot of you know forests or and agricultural places or plots, lands. So. Yeah, so we discussed a lot of, uh, we discussed it and we've, we found um, a solution. So, yeah, and that solution, we found that we need some, you know, um, a wider knowledge and information sharing to the small, whole, whole, small farmers because the farmers, the small, the small farmers don't have such an upper, a privilege or an information because you know that not all farmers, uh, I'm sorry, but not all farmers are literate, right? Not all farmers are that, you know, some farmers are, they don't feel confident of, because they have all, they are just a small farmers and they don't have like, you know, they don't have the opportunity to seek, seek to seek help from the agricultural organizations. So that's why we need to look after the small Small hold partners. So second is the is um, working together. The problem is, you know, that yeah, they, they have organizations. There are a lot of organizations on our connections, but we don't have um, they don't have you know let such capable. No, sorry, but not have that capabilities, right? To you know, not expand. That's why we need. They need some other agriculture, agriculture organizations to connect with them to introduce to have connections because you know that connections is very good in business. So if you have a lot of connections, you can ask, seek help, right? To other organizations too. So yeah, I just that's the two of the main. There I know that there are a lot of cause the problems and solutions, but these two are our main our main discussions. And yeah, I'm just gonna leave some saying that that we don't have did don't just focus on what produce, but also let us look on who produces it. Right? So investors and youth, let's act, be responsible and let's think sustainable. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lance. That was very nice for highlighting certain aspects that were also mentioned in the plenary earlier. Smallholder farmers face a lot of problems, and we have to have we have to foster partnerships to be able to give support. 
And so thank you, Lance, for that session. Let's proceed to parallel session B. We had uh, Jesse Varkas with this one. This is about uh, rediscovering Southeast Asian culture and food. We have Rosaline from Agusan del Sur, Philippines. Rosaline? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear Rosaline, me, ma'am? Can you turn on your camera, please? Show us your pretty face. All right. Hello, Hi. ma'am. Uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce myself. I am Rosaline Arungalupo from uh, Anislagan, San Luis, Agusan del Sur, Philippines. <laughs> Completo. So, ayan po. Uh, our discussion in our plenary is about how to uh, the landscape of uh, and how to help our small farmers. Uh, for me, uh, in in our discussion, we have uh, we have discussed about the um, the problems that the small hold, small uh, holders farmers are are facing. So one of them is for me one of, uh, because I am uh, a daughter of a farmer. So uh, actually, my father is here, and uh, I know their challenges i know their life i know i know the farm uh, the life of a farmer because i am one of them i am one of the children of the farmer so uh, one of the problems of the small time farmers are the lack of uh, education about the sustainable farming uh, number two uh, lack of access to the digitalization in the new era so, so for now because we know that uh, if we, we have a business and we are not in the dig, uh, in, in the digital space. We are uh, we are uh, we are left behind. So uh, and that is one of the problems of, uh, that the farmers are facing. And number four is the lack of digital literacy. So so for me, uh, I am I am an owner of a small a very small business, agri business. My mission is to help them educate them. Uh, help them become aware of what is truly a, 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 a sustainable agriculture is and how how they can help themselves uh, survive in the uh, uh, problem uh, uh, how, how they can solve the problem that they are facing most especially the fertilizers are very expensive right now so I am advocating organic farming so I am uh, very blessed that I um uh, I belong to an association that is very uh, uh, committed to help the farmers. So I, I am blessed to be the secretary. So so we are our our association is uh, committed to become uh, one of the uh, platforms that a small time farmer can go and can help uh, can seek help most especially and education. So so if they want to seek for. Uh, uh, right information about farming or about business or how to market their products so we can help them and I, I am very uh, uh, thankful for this platform mom I am very blessed and I'm very privileged to be one of this uh, one of the participants because I want to really raise the voice of the farmers and most especially the children of the farmers because one uh, the farmers are the most uh, uh, the most underserved are the most uh, uh, let's say let's just say the poorest sector in our country so so i want to raise our voice as children that we i we hope that uh, the government the public and private institution can uh, should really uh, see us uh, and look at us and um, stay, extend their hand to help us uh, help our sector so Thank you for uh, thank you for this opportunity, ma'am. I, I hope uh, one of our uh, one uh, I hope that the farmers can really have a, a right platform that uh, they can uh, seek uh, seek solutions and they can uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> thank you, Miss Rosaline. Okay, so from Miss Rosaline, another sharing about smallholder farmers. So thank you for emphasizing that, but also. Different from what Lance said, Lance emphasized on Lance emphasized on um, smallholder farmers and finding support for this one uh, and uh, finding partnership. And for Rosaline, she highlighted smallholders again and giving them ample support or sustain or support for sustainable agriculture. All interrelated. Next, we have parallel session C with Doc Jess. 
Uh, this is about the Nutrition Goes to School program for a nutrition sensitive youth. We have Agus Setioko. Mr. Agus? Hi, sir. Yes. Can you hear me twice? Yourself, your location, and then you may proceed with your report. Okay. Thank you very much for the time given to me. I am Agus Setioko from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And here I'm as a representative from uh, the Group C. I would like to uh, deliver uh, the result of our discussion about the topic that's securing and nutrition conscious young generation by promoting healthy diets in schools. Uh, to promote healthy diets in schools, there are uh, so many problems that uh, we have to solve it. Uh, from our discussion, uh, we we have problem that we have uh, we uh, that we have to solve it and to apply this program. First, why the young generation in in the world, especially in Indonesia, uh, don't they don't care about the uh, the diets? Because yeah, as, especially for the young generation, they don't care about the healthy diet. Because first, this. Um, Clearly, lack of uh, the supply in our country in why the interfacient local production hydrants opportunity to access a more sufficient and nutritious food supply. Uh, and we would like to recommend that we should start practice growing our own food for a more sustainable and safer food supply. And especially, uh, we have to, uh, there's a mindset, wrong mindset from the, the parents that especially in Indonesia, uh, even, for example, my parents are, are a farmers, but they always say to me, don't be a farmer anymore in the future. Please move to the city and work as an uh, industrial empower, uh, employer, uh, industrial employee or uh, teacher or, or etc. But don't be a farmer anymore uh, like us. It's wrong mindset that we have to change it as soon as possible. And the second is the high cost of food, uh, especially for the rural uh, rural line or rural place, um, the price of food or nutritious food is so high uh, compared to the uh, the central city um, because uh, from the rural food they cannot access it uh, easily, uh, so they have to pay uh, and uh, to pay it's more uh, exp more expensive than than to the uh, central city. So the accessible of the the food is uh, very important to solve in the future. And the, the third is the, the most um, stores and vendors uh, usually sell junk food and other processed food that are very accessible to learners. Yeah. It means that uh, junk food is uh, very popular in uh, among the young generation right now, and they forget about the local food. Uh, if we compare, junk food is less nutritious than the uh, local food, for, for example, in uh, Jogjakarta, uh, we 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 has a popular local food. Or we call it as a kebab. It's made from uh, cassava, and very uh, popular in the farmers, but less popular in the young generation. And the fourth, uh, we heavily relying on pesticide. Uh, make effect quality of food is lower. Uh, to uh, uh, be better to to change it into organic fertilizer to, to produce uh, healthy food, especially for young generation. Um, we always depend on uh, the pesticide or even import product because in young uh, in the young generation, import product is really high organic position than uh, the local. So local community produce which affect the young children health. Uh, as, as mentioned before, uh, uh, in our young generation, uh, we, we, we forget about the traditional food, traditional food or local food that is better high nutrition content compared to the junk food. And, all, all, and also we have uh, some solution how to increase our to promote uh, healthy diet in, in the school for the children, for the young generation is first, uh, we do education nutrition. It means that 
uh, we com uh, we cooperate with uh, uh, the government and also the um, in the school how to if uh, educate about the nutrition food how many uh, the kind of uh, nutrition food and uh, how to consume it well and the second and the second uh, step is uh, to do uh, school gardening yeah it's to teach the young generation to love their uh, uh, local food or their uh, traditional food, for example, uh, cassava, yam, and and etc. But it also we we also have a problem. How about the uh, the school in the city? Uh, they, they don't enough land to do uh, gardening school. Uh, we can uh, give solution to do a hydroponic uh, garden. It's uh, uh, we don't we don't need uh, land to to plant our our plants and the, the third is uh we call it as a uh, school canteen uh, school canteen can be one facility how to provide a traditional and nutritional food for the young generation so they can uh, now uh, as soon as possible about their local food and they they feel that they proud uh, to be the farmers is not uh i mean uh, it's not a uh, allow uh, to be a farmer is not only for the low economical condition job, but it is it is a uh, such a luxury, luxury, I mean luxury uh, jobs that uh, we can if we success to promote uh, the mindset and also this program. I'm sure that we we saw that in the future uh, the sufficient of uh, healthy food for the young generation will be completed and uh, we we can we can avoid uh, malnutrition and etc. and Nutrition disease in the future. I think that's enough for our uh, discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Agus, for that. So, this session is very uh, linked, very much linked to Dr. Cho's session earlier. So, thank you, Agus, for sharing how it is like for Jakarta or for Indonesia. I like that you shared how it is for the urban areas and the rural areas. So, thank you for that sharing. Um, again, similar to Dr. Charles called earlier, we have to be nutrition sensitive and nutrition conscious so that, and then we can do that by introducing it to the school programs and eventually scaling out to communities. And for our last presenter from Parallel Session D, Innovation Opportunities During Times of Disruptions, this is with Juka Laxina of Go Eden PH. We have Joel Obrero from Central Luzon State University. Joel? And hello, good day, everyone. Um, I hope that you're still alive, alert, and awake at this moment. All right, go ahead, Joel. Sorry, you were, you're on mute, Joel. You're on mute. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, po. okay. Um, good day, everyone. So I hope that you're still alive, alert, and awake at this moment. And um, I'm going to discuss um, the challenges and the proposed solutions that are discussed um, during the, uh, uh, the parallel session D of this event, which is entitled Youth Voices for a Food Secure Future, Perspectives from Southeast Asia, which was discussed by uh, Ms. Ju Kalaksina, the President and the, and the Chief Executive Officer of the Go Eden Philippines. But before that, let me introduce myself. I am Joel Obero. I am an Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering freshman student in the Central Luzon State University at the Science City of Munoz in the province of Nueva Ecija. And okay, um, going forward, um, so the challenges that was discussed in the open forum of, of our parallel session are the following. So we have the poverty, we discussed about the poverty and hunger. Also, uh, we found out that the idle lands are not maximized for productivity. Uh, we are also lacking of government support and in the part of the indigenous people communities, we are lacking of knowledge and education. Um, we also have limited facilities that can cater to food and agricultural innovation. Um, also, one of the great problems um, that we have is the brain drain, which we know as uh, the migration to other countries uh, for work opportunities. And as we know that um, the population of the overseas Filipino workers or OFW are are getting bigger now, and but we need them since um, you know um, each one of us has um, potentials. We believe in their cap capabilities and their impacts that they can do in our society. And also, um, one of also our also one of the challenges that we're 
with what that we are facing in the field of agriculture is a lack of knowledge on on technology to shift to modern agriculture, which we can insert the uh, digital divide that is getting worse um, as time goes by. And also there are, la there are lacking of opportunities in agriculture. Um, and as we know, um, in reality, agriculture is one of the most neglected um, um, sectors in our society. And it is one of, it, it is one of the uh, challenges that we are facing here. And also, um, politicians are focused on our own imports as part of their political strategies. And also, uh, we have limited facilities for local machineries to develop local and uh, local uh, agriculture um, tailor fitted to local settings or mechanization. And finally, many modern technologies are not fitted to social cultural norms. So um, we actually have um, several technologies that we use um, in agriculture, but since um, uh, farmers and um, agricultural practitioners um, think that these technologies are too complex for them to understand, so they go back to, um, to, the, to the traditional um, technologies that they, that they are used, and they know how to operate. And the next are the proposed solutions. So I'm glad that um, that some of my group mates in our uh, parallel um, session discussed um, several proposed solutions from actually from different countries. So from Vietnam, um, 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 that person um, proposed competition for undergraduates aimed at creating innovative solutions for agriculture and climate change, backed of course by the government support. And from the Philippines, someone suggested about public and private partnerships or PPP. And from Indonesia, um, partnerships with Ministry of Education um, for curriculum changes and also training. And from the Philippines, which I suggested, um, is the youth focused training in executing ideas to reality and funding support and also focus on agriculture as it is the backbone of our economy. And I believe that if we, if we put focus in, um, in our agricultural sector, I believe that our economy will bring out its best. And finally, um, uh, uh, building comprehensible technology for farmers, as we discussed that it is a challenge earlier. So that's all. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. Thank you, Joel. That was nice. So as we heard from Joel, there are a lot of a multitude of problems, a multitude of challenges present, right? But there is always opportunities to innovate, to make solutions if we work together as men, as again, Partnerships as a keyword, if we work together, there will be available opportunities to innovate and maybe overcome these challenges. So thank you, everyone. Send your details. Um, sorry, for the presenters, for the reporters, kindly refer to the chat box. My email address is there. Send your details to me so we can send you your SYF merch. If you miss my email address, you can just message our Circa Facebook so we can contact you regarding uh, your details. So thank you to our parallel session experts, to our reporters, and to our participants. Your sessions must have been fun and exciting, as is mine, and there seems to be so much learning exchange that happened that I already do not know how to sum it up because there are just so many ideas that came about. Okay, now we would like to share something that we invite you and your friends to join and help spread the word. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Circa, through Y4 Agri, launched the Youth Co-Video Contest to showcase young people's contribution to local food production, may it be in their homes, schools, or the community. In its third year, the video contest rebrands to Youth Stories, Circa Youth Video Contest, to welcome a new variety of agriculture-related themes. In its third year, the video contest rebrands to, sorry, Youth Stories aims to realize the challenges and adversities that the youth in agriculture experience or are experiencing and gather their solutions and actions. And this video contest can serve as an avenue for the youth in agriculture to speak their minds, tell their stories, and be heard. Please watch this short video to learn more about this year's themes and mechanics.
this year's theme, Amplifying Voices of Youth Agripreneurs, welcome, welcomes video entries featuring success stories of youth in agriculture enterprises. Watch out for updates on the Circa and YFAR Agri Facebook pages and through our website at www.circa.org. Aside from our video contest, we also have an ongoing photo contest. In its 16th year, Circa's annual photo contest centers on emerging agricultural innovations for the next generation. Win as much as 1,000 US dollars and you can get the chance to be this year's best youth photographer. Sorry, photographer. Visit our Facebook pages and photo contest and website at photocontest.circa.org to learn more about the contest mechanics. Again, visit Circa's Facebook pages and photocontest.circa.org as you can see on your screens. Circa also has many opportunities in store for you. We also have scholarships for postgraduate studies, grants for research towards agricultural innovative solutions, and short-term training programs. On behalf of the Center, I invite you to visit our website at www.circa.org for more details. So what now? What's next? Multiple meaningful and inspiring discussions this morning, and where do we find ourselves now? I invite our very own colleague, our SIAP youth lead who inspires us and pushes us to maximize our potentials as leaders and change agents in agriculture and rural development, Mr. Sonny Pashona. Sonny will share with us our youth action. Thank you, Jean. We are almost at the end of this forum part of the Southeast Asian Youth Fest, and we thank you for staying with us up to this time. So earlier in the parallel sessions, we asked you to share with us your actions. What will youth do to contribute to a food secure future? So what you can see in your screen, these are just some of the highlights, some of the, some of the answers that you have provided to us towards the end of that session. So um, many of you said that you will be joining the advocacy and promoting sustainable food systems. Uh, you will change the, your eating habits, making healthy choices even reducing or avoiding food waste. And we can see responses from our young teachers here. You talk about uh, educating other people. So hopefully you will share what you have learned today to your students, uh, to your family, friends, and neighbors. Uh, some of the pledges also include promoting local food uh, by promoting it in your own backyards or even in schools. Uh, I like this one. Uh, somebody said, diversification of nutritious food that can be produced locally. So nutrition-sensitive agriculture, as emphasized by our keynote speaker earlier. And I can see a lot of um, advocacy work by volunteering. So yes, because we actually saw a lot of young people and youth organizations who became more active on food security efforts at the height of the pandemic. And also, since we are promoting uh, innovation, uh, we've seen some... Uh, as in their capacity as teachers or even as students to help facilitate tech transfer and introducing innovations and modern technologies in agriculture. So in general, we are happy to note that uh, our youth participants are able to share their action, whether small or big. Uh, earlier, Rosalyn also said uh, she is representing not just her voice, but that of smallholder farmers and even ch children of farmers. So thank you very much for highlighting that, Rosaline. And many of you also mentioned about starting small and starting at home while others are thinking bigger, such as um, influencing governance mechanisms, lobbying for enabling policies, particularly on youth investments and training. When we talk about uh, food system transformation, it seems like a very big and complex challenge. Uh, Dr. Chufok team even described it as insurmountable. But we agree with him that little steps based on what we can do can go a long way. And Dr. Keen Marcho, on the other hand, told us that we must start today by changing the way we treat food. Our little actions as young people when combined can create a dent to the food system. And so from your own words and your own voices, Youth will act first on what you can control or within the circles of your influence to help contribute to a food secure future. We do not 
need to think far or high level right away because on a personal level and within your community and even workplaces, we can appreciate the little actions that we can do, such as making that conscious effort to be aware about our food system, particularly in promoting sustainable diets. The fact that you are here with us today means that you are interested to educate yourself and hopefully not just for the e-certificates, but really to understand how our food system works, the current situation, and the actionable solutions that youth can implement. So now allow me to formally close this event on behalf of CIRCA, led by our director, Dr. Glenn Gregorio. We thank our keynote speakers, the parallel session experts for covering culture, innovation, curriculum, and even investments as part of our food system work. And thank you as well for the ideas on how our participants can apply solutions to their own context. To all of the youth participants, thank you for joining, for listening, and most importantly, for sharing your voices. Yes, our voices do matter, but on a bigger scale, our collective, collective actions to a food secure future are what will matter the most. We are counting on you, the youth of Southeast Asia, so thank you and have a good day. All right, thank you, Sunny. That sums up our forum for the Southeast Asian Youth Fest. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Southeast Asian Youth Fest or SYF. On behalf of Circa, of Saya, my fellow youth ambassadors, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It has been a great and productive way to start our weekend, right? What do you think? So before we close, please let us know what you think about the SYF by following the link to a quick feedback form shown on your screens. Hi again, and in your respective chat boxes. The same link will direct you to the request form for the e-certificate. Your feedback will help us improve our online learning events. Please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this forum. That is until tomorrow. Kindly wait for your e-certificate to be issued at least within a month as we receive a lot of requests for e-certificates. Remember, there are 1,278 of you who registered. So thank you for your understanding and patience. Those who were selected to receive the SYF bag, please wait for the announcement on our Facebook pages. You still have a chance to win as well for those. So there are five bags that we are giving away. So post your learnings from this Youth Fest and use the hashtag SYF2022 and hashtag y 4 agri so we can monitor your posts. Once again, this is Jean Labios. Jean Labios, SYF representative. Have a good one. <laughs>